I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about the release of Dr. Elliot Cohen's new book, The Hollow Crown, Shakespeare on How Leaders Rise, Rule, and Fall, we have with us none other than Elliot Cohen. Elliot, the book is fantastic, The Hollow Crown, and I want to talk about it. But first, I want to ask you about what's going on in Israel and in Gaza. It is really a mess. You've spent a lot of time studying the Israeli military, and you know it inside and out. What is your judgment of how the IDF is performing right now? Thank you for that, Andrew. I've been writing a bit about this in The Atlantic, as I usually do, and there'll be another piece coming out shortly on this. Clearly, the Israelis have seen just a massive intelligence, but also a massive operational failure with the October 7th massacre. As is often the case, you know, people tend to swing from one view of the IDF to another, from thinking that they're a bunch of supermen, which they're not to thinking that they're a bunch of incompetence, which they are most definitely not. The most important thing I think one can say about the IDF, as I've said to a number of people, including to one Secretary of State, is that you have to understand that the history of the IDF is a history of repeated failures. And this goes back to before there was a Israel Defense Forces, when you had the underground military of the Haganah and so forth, one failure after another, and then extremely rapid recovery. And I think that's really what you're seeing now. It's also the case, I think, that the IDF, even though they've been focused very much more on the West Bank and above all on Lebanon and Hezbollah and Iran, have given a lot of thought to this conflict. They actually know a lot about Hamas and they have trained for it. And what I think we're seeing now is the Israelis going into Gaza. I don't think they're going to simply roll over the entire Gaza Strip in a few days. This is not intended to be a blitzkrieg. Instead, I think what you're going to find is a very difficult incremental fight, but one which they will continue to succeed at, where they will kind of piece by piece dismantle Hamas and the tunnel networks Recent history teaches us that this can be done. It's what the Iraqis with American and some other outside help did in Mosul. It's what the American military did in Fallujah. The Israelis have had a lot of time to think about this particular problem. They know a lot about it. And above all, they're motivated. It's going to be a terrible fight, and a lot of civilians are going to get killed. I think the Israelis will take a lot of casualties, unfortunately. But I think they're going to be pretty successful in the long run. Elliot, what is the IDF doing to minimize civilian casualties? We hear a lot about civilian casualties in Gaza, but we also hear from the Israelis that everything they're doing is intended to be as precise as possible without harming innocent civilians. But that's difficult in the most densely populated city, basically on Earth, with a network, as you say, of tunnels and booby traps and all other kinds of things. So how does Israel try to think about minimizing civilian death? And I would say with one other element as well, which is that Hamas very deliberately and very cynically uses civilians as cover, whether it's putting rocket launchers in uh, kindergartens or having their headquarters underneath the hospital. This is very, very well documented, and they've done a lot of it. The short answer is a lot of civilians are going to get killed and and wounded. I mean, this is that is simply unavoidable. Historically, the Israelis have actually gone to pretty great lengths. So they've done things like so-called knocking on apartment buildings before they attack them. That is, you drop an inert projectile, it can just be a piece of concrete or something, which makes a big thump on a building before you you drop it, basically tell people to get out. Or they used to send out phone messages to people saying, get out of this building now, and things of that kind. I think they will continue to do that, but I suspect that they are doing less of that. That is to say that I think, you know, it used to be the case that the Israelis, like the United States, would refrain from taking a shot at a opposing leader if they were surrounded by their family, and particularly children. I'm not sure that that's going to be the case anymore. For me, the most important change is that the Israelis now understand this as a sort of an existential conflict, where the objective is not to mow the lawn, as the saying went, to contain Hamas, to deter Hamas, to limit its potential. Those were all objectives in the past. I think they really are out to destroy it. 
And they think that if they don't do that, the costs for them are just going to be way higher than even they were on October 7th. So they will be more ruthless. I mean, it's Let's talk about those costs. What are those costs? When you say an existential threat to Israel, we're talking about a threat to Israel's very existence, aren't we? First thing, of course, is Hamas is determined to eradicate the state of Israel, as is Iran, as is Hezbollah. And if there's one thing that Israelis, to some extent Jews, have learned is if somebody says that they're out to eliminate you, they really do mean it, and you better act accordingly. I think the Israelis believe that if they don't destroy Hamas, Hamas will regenerate. If you have a ceasefire and reconstruction, that'll go to more tunnels, more rockets, and so on. So that first, you'll have a repeat of October 7th, but even worse. Secondly, that if Hamas somehow can survive this, it will have gained a victory, which will encourage and empower others. Thirdly, I think they believe that if Hamas succeeds, that that will really tempt Hezbollah and Iran to join in the fight. And Hezbollah has even more assets, something like 150,000 rockets that they could shower down on Israel, overwhelming missile defenses and so on. So there's an issue here of rebuilding Israel's deterrent image, which is something the Israelis have thought about a lot. The other thing is, if Hamas can make life in Israel barely endurable, the Israelis have to worry about, you know, will the economy collapse? Will a lot of the high-tech people leave? Will they be able to get investment? So there's a question of damaging the essential viability of the state. You can't overstate how much the existential question has come back. And that's not something Israelis have thought about since 1973, 50 years ago. Everybody, I think, needs to proceed from that understanding. Why do you think Israel stopped thinking that way and was caught so unaware in this case on October 7th? In one of my pieces in The Atlantic, I quote an Israeli general from 1973 who said that our sin was the sin of arrogance. He actually used a line from the Yom Kippur liturgy, which made it particularly powerful. I think it was arrogance. I think they thought that they had the situation under control. I think they believed that Hamas had decided to accommodate itself to them to some extent, that by opening up the border for more workers from Gaza, which they were doing in the tens of thousands, and allowing in money from Qatar, it was controlled. And the fact is that Israel has not faced an existential conventional threat since 1973. That was the last time that Israelis really worried that an enemy could reach in and physically destroy the country. And so for 50 years, there was a tremendous amount of overconfidence, clearly. But I don't think they're going to make that mistake again. As a result of this episode, we've seen a rise of anti-Semitism in the United States and globally. As this continues to grind on, it's hard to imagine that lessening. Do you think the world is turning against Israel? And does it matter if the world does? And what do you think the support here at home is like and likely to be? I don't think the world was ever particularly on Israel's side. I think the people who are the friends of Israel will continue to be. I think anti-Semitism is the world's most durable and extensive hatred. It has many different roots. It is an age-old phenomenon rooted in all kinds of things. And sadly, Israelis, but above all, I would just say Jews simply face that fact and know that fact. The Jewish population of the world has still not recovered from the Holocaust. And I think people who are identifying Jews are fully aware of that. It takes a particularly malign form right now because it is coming from both left and right. And there's two things that the extremes can agree on. It's that they hate Jews. But it's also the case that governments can make use of anti-Semitism and do. We could go more broadly into what's happened on university campuses and who are the people in newsrooms around the world. But at the end of the day, I don't know how much it really matters because very few of these people have the courage of their malign convictions. They like to protest and demonstrate and perfectly happy to mob a bunch of outnumbered Jews if they think they're not going to get hurt doing it. But beyond that, not a whole lot. And the fact is, Israel has some very staunch friends in the United States and elsewhere, starting with the president. At the end of the day, they will outlast it and the Jewish people will outlast it. There's a long list of peoples and leaders who've come after the Jews. 
And whenever I go to Rome, I always walk by the Arch of Titus, which has you know these very famous reliefs of the captured instruments of the temple in Jerusalem, slaves being paraded through the arch. And you know, I say, Titus, where's the Roman Empire now? I guess who's still around? I would say I'm kind of grimly confident that Israel will get through it, and Jews abroad, no matter where they live, will get through it. But it's a daunting time. And I think particularly in some countries, it's going to be a lot worse than others. Elliot, thank you for that. I want to turn to your book, which is a happier subject. Much happier. We celebrated your book here last week at CSIS. And if anyone wants to watch a really terrific book launch, check out CSIS.org for the launch of Elliot's book. I want to say the title again. It's called The Hollow Crown Shakespeare on How Leaders Rise, Rule, and Fall. Elliot, what made you think first of writing this book? I have always loved Shakespeare. The germ was probably initially planted when my wife and I went to see a production of Henry VIII, which is one of the plays that is less often put on and which was probably actually co-authored by Shakespeare with another playwright, John Fletcher. There's a great moment when Cardinal Wolsey, who's been effectively the prime minister of King Henry VIII, is deposed. And if you'll bear with me, I'll just read this wonderful speech that he gives, which he says, Farewell, a long farewell to all my greatness. This is the state of man. Today he puts forth the tender leaves of hopes, tomorrow blossoms, and bears his blushing honors thick upon him. The third day comes a frost, a killing frost, and when he thinks good easy man, full surely his greatness is a ripening, nips his root, and then he falls as I do. I have ventured like little wanton boys that swim on bladders this many summers in a sea of glory, but far beyond my depth. My high-blown pride at length broke under me, and now has left me weary and old with service, to the mercy of a rude stream that must forever hide me. When I heard that, I said to myself, wow, I know that guy. I think any of us in Washington know that guy. One thing led to another. You know, I began talking about some of the speeches with my students that led to a first a non-credit course, then a credit course, then a, after a conversation with my publisher and my agent, we thought there'd be a book there. It's a different kind of Shakespeare book. It's I'm not a literature professor. But what I do try to do is bring to bear what I know as a military and diplomatic historian, what I've experienced as a senior government official, dare I say it, even as a dean, and try to bring that to bear on Shakespeare. And I try to talk about his views of power and of what it means to to rule or to lead, not by going play by play, but by going through what I call the arc of power, from how people acquire it, how they use it and then how they lose it or, in the best case, walk away from it. Ellie, what is it about Shakespeare's works that help us better understand power and politics in a modern context? I think there are a number of things. First, let's be clear. Shakespeare is not interested in some things. He's not interested in mass movements. He's not interested in ideology. He's not interested in economics. He is interested, first and foremost, and always, in character. And if there's anything we've learned in the last few years, it is just how important character is. What would the last decade have been without Donald Trump or Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping or you name it? For that reason alone, I think we would turn to Shakespeare. But there are other reasons as well. One is that in this book, I talk about a number of different forms of politics in Shakespeare, but one of them is the politics of courts. And if you think about it, every human organization that is somewhat hierarchical, has a court, by which I mean, you know, there's a ruler, there's usually a crown prince, there are a bunch of courtiers, and they all interact with each other. And Shakespeare is just brilliant at describing that. There's another thing that's very powerful about it, I think, and that is Shakespeare very frequently uses theater as a metaphor for understanding politics. That is to say, there's a stage, there are actors, there's a director, there are critics, there's an audience. And if you think very hard about applying that metaphor, you see just how powerful it can be. And I don't think you think about politics the same way if you look at it and say, wow, we are seeing a kind of theater here. You know, our tendency is to look at theater and, and similarly to look at rhetoric and just sort of dismiss it as something that's kind of cheap or superficial or epiphenomenal, doesn't really matter. 
But Shakespeare teaches us, no, those things matter a lot. I find that Shakespeare is just a marvelous guide to reframing politics by looking at those elements of it. According to Shakespeare, in your judgment, what qualities make for an effective leader? The kind of book I never wanted to write and I did not write is, you know, the 17 leadership secrets of William Shakespeare. I've always objected to that best management practices of Attila the Hun kind of genre of books about bad leaders. I think Shakespeare does see the ability to master the theater of power as being very important for any leader. I think he does expose us a lot to the role of self-knowledge in leadership and the extent to which leaders who really fool themselves about who they are eventually set themselves up for very serious trouble. For sure, he shows us what eloquence can and cannot do. The best case, what eloquence can do is if you look at Henry V rallying the troops before the Battle of Agincourt. Now, I, I take a very dark view of Henry V, the Shakespearean character, not the play, which is a marvelous play. I just think Henry V as a character is a complete stinker, but he is a genius at public speaking. You know, he get, does a lot with that. Now, there are other people who are extremely eloquent, like Richard II or the Roman general Coriolanus, who are also brilliant talkers, but it just gets them in trouble. So I think Shakespeare takes a somewhat nuanced view of what it is that rhetoric could do for you. And then last thing I'd mention, I mean, there are others as well. The Shakespearean leaders who are successful tend not to have too many illusions. The ones who get into trouble believe in their own magic. And I have a chapter on magic, which is quite important in Shakespeare. And what magic in Shakespeare usually is, is the vehicle by which a leader fools themselves into thinking that they are something other than what they are. You know, I use the examples of Joan of Arc and to some extent Macbeth. But you can apply that very much to contemporary political leaders as well, who become believers in their own magic in differing ways and to differing degrees, stumble as a result of that. Tell me about your favorite plays and your favorite Shakespeare works. Well, that's always the, uh, the question, and it's really hard. I think Julius Caesar is a perfect play in the same way that uh, Casablanca is a perfect movie. You know, I think Casablanca is a perfect movie because... There is not a single unnecessary word in the script. You know, it is just so tight. And I have a very similar feeling about Julius Caesar. The economy of language is terrific. The complexity of the characters, some of the devices that he uses to illuminate the characters, I just think is simply marvelous. I do think Henry V is a great play in a number of ways. One of which is, and again, bear in mind, I, I take a very dark view of Henry, that so much of what the Shakespearean Henry V does is he fools his followers and he fools the people around him about what he's up to. He manipulates them. He gets them to do what he wants them to do. But the great thing about it is he fools us too. Even when Shakespeare has shown us that Henry is hypocritical, he's using people, and all that stuff, we still fall in love with him. And this really hit me when I was teaching it. And, you know, we walk through all of the things he does. He has one of his best friends executed. He sets up this sort of Stalinist show trial for a bunch of nobles who've turned against him. He seduces this French princess whose relatives he's just massacred by pretending to be a bluff, simple soldier, which he most definitely is not. Yeah, I could go on and on. I do all this, and then I say, okay, time for a show of hands. If Henry V walked into the room right now and said, follow me, how many of you would follow him? All the hands shoot up. I don't think that was a reflection of my inadequate teaching. Maybe it was. I don't know. What I think it really was was a reflection on just how powerful Shakespeare's genius is. He shows you everything, but you've got to figure it out for yourself. It does take a lot of figuring out. And speaking of which... I want to ask you about a modern conflict, which you've been studying and writing about a lot, and that's Ukraine. How can your book help audiences better understand the strategy and motivation behind Putin's aggression in Ukraine? So I talk about that in the book. I describe how I was at the Munich Security Conference, which is a big annual national security confab, really about two days before the February 22 invasion. 
the consensus among the Europeans, not among the Americans, because the, the American intelligence community was being pretty unambiguous, but among the Europeans was, well, there may be a conflict, but if it happens, Putin will try to grab a piece of Ukraine, or this is just a big bluff, but he's not going to try to take the whole thing. That would be crazy and over the top. And I wasn't so sure. And the reason why is I reread Richard III. And Richard III is the character in Shakespeare is one of the all-time baddies. I mean, he's really terrible. He's a very seductive figure, and we enjoy watching him. The thing that had struck me about the play on this rereading is that the first three acts of the play, he's doing terrible things. You know, he has his brother drowned in a cask of sweet wine, but he's clever, he's indirect, he covers his tracks. In Act 4, he commits the big crime, which is the murder of his two nephews in the Tower of London. And his number two, who turns says, you want me to do what? And he says, I want the bastards dead and wish it done suddenly. Do you understand? So the filters are all off. He's brutally open about what he wants and almost kind of maniacal in his desire to do that. He Buckingham hesitates a little bit. Next thing you know, Buckingham is off to the block. He also uses the same sort of language that Putin did. You know, Putin, before the invasion, said, where is the effect of, uh, like it or not, you'll have to accept it, my beauty, talking to Ukraine. So it's a threat of rape. Richard III invokes rape as well. He's more of a seducer, but rape is on the table as well. And it just struck me then that dictators don't remain stable. They evolve, they change. And what happens is after they've had a whole string of successes, whatever it was that had kept them being clever, indirect, covering their tracks, cautious, goes away. And Putin had been extraordinarily successful. He'd been quite clever and adroit in Georgia, to some extent in Syria, certainly in the invasion of Crimea and of Donbass. But at this point, he didn't feel he had to. And the brutality of his language made me think that maybe this time this guy is ready to do anything because he thinks he can get away with anything. And it turned out fundamentally he could not. Elliot, this book is truly wonderful. And I hope everybody gets one now and in time for the holidays to give to their family. It's something I'll treasure. I've got my autograph copy sitting right here. So thanks again for this book. Thanks for your analysis, and thanks for being such a great friend of the podcast. Well, uh, Andrew, it's always great to come on. Thanks for being such a great interviewer. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts. From Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 